Hello, and welcome to episode 66 of Random Encounter, the RPG Fan Podcast. I'm your host, Robert Steinman, Pale Robbie on the boards. Joining me today, we have... Uh, I got nothing for you, Steven, so just hop in there. Wow, that really makes me sound exciting. Steven Myring, Taylor's on the boards. Sorry, I just couldn't think of anything. Like, I, I was having, like, a brain fart, and I was just... You could have said, like, chronically late today. That would have been a good one, because you were... Extremely... Yeah, you were extremely late today. Steven is my favorite Steven. If that helps. Thank you. That's Derek. Hi, this is Derek. You're my favorite Derek, and I know a couple Dereks. Yeah, I know a couple Stevens. Also, I'm Embryon on the boards, even though I don't post on those a lot. I'm still going to tell you that every episode. Hello. There we go. So, first off, uh, I just have to say a huge, huge, huge thank you to the RPG fan family, as well as, what's his name, Steven? Uh, I apologize if I mispronounce it, but uh, Jean-Marc... Uh, Giffen. Giffon? Giffon. Giffon. Giffon Jean Marc. Right. He, he goes by Jean of Marc on emails, so I prefer that because that sounds cool. Okay, so. And Jean- I can pronounce that. So I want to thank maybe. everybody because uh, after I got married and uh, I was going through all my, my wedding gifts and everything, which was, you know, a lot of silverware, a lot of fiesta wear, uh, unmentionables, not a whole lot, you know, that I'm. For you or for. Wait, wait, Jack? unmentionables, what? Do guys get unmentionables? Of course did, guys don't. Did get you get the black waist that I sent you? Or? Jesus. I thought unmentionables were the word for, like, your, 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 your jank. No, oh my god, wow. Are you referring to, like, underwear? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. Wow. And did we not send him the one or did we mix it up and accidentally Good send Lord. him the 3DS? Okay, hey, all right. That's <laughs> wait, did, did you get the 3DS? Oh. Yes. Damn I... it. Yes, I got the 3DS, and I want to we thank... We sent him the wrong package. Uh, I must explain this fabulous set of lingerie I just received. So th- I wanted to thank everybody <laughs> for uh, contributing to giving to getting me a 3DS XL. Uh, I have been having an absolute blast on it and neglecting my wife quite a bit. Uh, but that's okay, because I'm playing a lot of Virtue's Last Reward, and that makes everything okay. I wouldn't say that's okay, but all right. <laughs> She's, like, trying let's, to hit me right let's, now. Let's use the term that's acceptable for Rob at this point in time. And okay. she's she's That's taking fine. away my 3ds now. Okay, As Any, she should. Well, anyway. now it's her 3ds, I guess. You are right. married, so all I guess right. she has that. All right, all right, all right. So we will talk about that here in a few minutes. But once again, I just wanted to thank everybody. That was a very heartwarming gift. So you are welcome. You, are you deserve welcome. it, even though you're a jerk face. How am I a jerk face? You're you're not. I know. Well, your, pic- your picture on Sky- I, Skype is Diablo, so I mean that that That's is true. kind of jerk face. I'm a nice guy. I'm Sorry, a nice tight. guy. Okay, so. I figured, why don't we start by talking about something that we all, well, okay, maybe Derek didn't think it was going to be bad, but something that Steven and I were actively mocking for the past three years, and ah, ha, ha, look at Square Enix, they can't do anything right with Final Fantasy XIV, and then we started playing the beta, and Steven and I kind of went, you know, I I like this. I told you <laughs> so! <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> that's... I, I wrote on the message boards at RPG Fan, like, I think in January. I said, there's nothing Square Enix can do to get me interested in this game. I think it's going to tank. I think even if it's good, it's going to tank. Yada, 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 yada. And I spent most of the weekend playing it. Yeah, like, you really did. Like, I kept like, looking on Steam, and it was like, Steven is still playing A Realm Reborn, Final like, Fantasy XIV. Me. We left. We, My friend and Derek and Mike, we were playing. Like, I played with, I played with Mike until, like, late at night on Saturday. Or on Friday or something. Friday morning and then, into Saturday. <laughs> and then I woke up and Rob was like, hey, play Final Fantasy. I'm like, okay. And then I got offline and I took a shower. And then Mike was like, hey, what are you doing? I go, not much. What are you doing? Playing Final Fantasy. Oh, I'll join you. And then everybody else got on. And then we played all day. And then I went to the grocery store and came back and played until the beta went, went off. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, it's kind of awesome. I, I Good lord, like, the, the only exposure that I had to Final Fantasy XIV were the review videos on, like, game trailers and things like that, which really made the game just look absolutely atrocious. Well, and it looked slow, it just, it looked it terrible. Was. It, it was. It just... was garbage. And that's, <clears throat> that's not being mean, that's just, it, it just was a functionally broken game. And I well, think that people didn't didn't understand how big of a rebuild this was. People thought that it was just a... A patch. Like a, we're gonna, yeah, like a patch. We're going to add some more in, you know, little tweaks here and there. But they, they built this game from the ground up. And yeah, it shows. Like, Everything about it is freaking flawless. Yeah, like Final Fantasy XIV version 1.0 was built on Crystal Tools, I think, which was the engine from Final Fantasy XIII and XIII-2. Right. 
which isn't made for an MMO. And that, I think that was part of the reason, I guess, there were problems with the original version. And so this yeah. new one is literally, it's built on a different engine completely. I don't, I don't know if it's Luminous Engine, but it's a new engine altogether. It, it uses parts of Luminous Engine. Okay, so it uses parts of Luminous Engine. It's not the same game. Like, it's literally... It's, it that, could not I, be any more different. And, and I, I personally think they're doing a good job with their messaging in saying this is a different game by calling it a Realm Reborn and kind of marginalizing the 14 subtitle. And I think even though they're doing a good job messaging it, they need to do a better job because if I read comments online, it's, well, I don't want to play it. The original version sucked. And I'm like, no, it's a different game. Yeah, I, I felt like I was evangelizing the game when I looked online. Uh, Steven linked me the collector's edition, which I'm going to be pre-ordering tonight. <laughs> and I and I see like comments on it like, hey, fool me once, you know, shame on me. And I'm like... Man, I understand the cynicism, and you know, hey, I, I felt the same way about this game. But if you play it, they put so much into this title; it's kind of shocking. It's like, yeah, whoa. Well, that's, that's what I was saying. I, don't think I was this like, never happened on this scale before for any game. No, it, it's a different game. That, that that's why I have to say, after they're showing at E three, and after all the effort that's gone into this, the feedback from their fans. I mean, some someone wrote online trying to diminish the accomplishment here he said well obviously it's good they've done nothing but take feedback from people that's what they should have done i'm like well so it's not a good achievement because they listened i yeah, go that's exactly. this is like, square enix we're talking about that doesn't make any sense it, it makes sense that they they sat down and said okay you know we got a lot of things to work on with this game we got to try a lot of stuff and they really did and uh, you know right off the bat the presentation of the game is just flat out gorgeous like yeah. i i am I'm in. I'm involved. I'm. I'm a big explorer. We talk about that in, when we podcast all the time about how I love worlds. I love being able to go around, and this world feels. It, I haven't seen this fleshed out of a Final Fantasy w world in, you know, like since what nine? Just where I, it feels this cohesive of a world. You're trying. You're trying to lead me into agreeing with you by saying nine. Yes. And I appreciate that, but I really do think twelve had a very involved, pretty looking world too. I can agree with that. There was like you know, the twelve had flaws, but I think the kind of uh, the care to detail was there in twelve, and, and I think fourteen 13, takes cues from that. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's the thing is fourteen is pretty much hey, was it a good idea in an earlier Final Fantasy? Okay, it's in. Yep, and and it works I, really well. Like you've got the the little dotted lines that represent the zones, the zone yeah, changes, and like and the little line twelve, and, and the targeting lines that come out of enemies. Yep, I love but those. The, the those first are thing. So I, cool. I think what's important to point out, too, is that I have not liked an MMO in, like, years. Like, I have not. I hate that, oh, I'm just going to grind and kill stuff, and I'm going to skip all the dialogue, and I, I don't care about exploring. I just want to level up. And this, that my, my thing with MMOs is the ones I really enjoyed, like Lotro and the original EverQuest, were that it was kind of about the journey. It wasn't about, oh, World of Warcraft style, i got to get to max level so I can run raids. It was, no, I want to have fun playing this game and exploring. And so when people say, oh, yeah, Final Fantasy 14 is just Final Fantasy 11 plus WoW, I'm like, that's kind of disingenuous. Yes, it's a lot. It's more like WoW. And yes, it's got your typical MMO structure. But everything has been polished and everything has – there's so many things you can do. And like the class system. So like Mike and I were running around as we were one class. And then it was like, hey, there's a stronger fate over there. Let's go do that free active time event. Oh, we can't. We're not high enough level. Oh, wait, I checked clicked a button now on my other class that's higher level we would go and do that and then it'd be like hey something cool looks in that town let's go do a guild test i'm like okay that's cool and so it's the the play is as organic as i was hoping it would be in guild wars because guild wars had such a great setup for that but it turned out to not really be that organic because it was just all right jump into the map all right where are all the things i have to go and do so i get completion in this area so that we can go on to the next one yeah. and again final fantasy 14 you get abilities from quests you can slot abilities from your other jobs, like in Final Fantasy V, which is just freaking masterful. And you have all these different jobs at your command at once. Whereas in Guild Wars, it was you've seen the extent of your character's progression basically by level 10. Like, yeah, you get those yep, other yeah. abilities, but they are not bread and butter. Those are, those are panic buttons. Right. And that's really what's so enticing to 14 about uh, with me is that I started the game. The first character I made, I made an archer. And I was like, OK, I'm not really digging on the archer. I, I get some people like him, but he, he doesn't. It, it, my character didn't feel like I had much impact on the battles. And I was like, OK, I'll start a new character. Oh, wait a minute. I can just easily switch my character class and not have to redo all of that stuff that I just did. How novel. Like, yep. that's one of those things that just sets this game so far apart, because when I played Guild Wars 2, which was admittedly my first MMO, I reached, like, level 50 with my engineer, and I was like, wow, I'm kind of 
tired of my engineer, and the only option available to me was to replay a character. Yeah, well, that, and, that was Final Fantasy XI's greatest strength, and being able to carry over your progress from missions and quests and just be able to change your class at any time gives you such a great degree of freedom that it yeah. makes everything you do meaningful. Like, you don't do quests where you say, okay, I'm doing this quest, but why bother reading the dialogue because I'm going to have to redo it again later? That's not my mindset or anything, but a lot of people mash through stuff and they get irritated because they have to redo those quests. That's not so in a game like 14. Everything yeah, like, you do matters because it carries over. Well, here's what really sold me on the quest system, on the class system. Because at first I said, I don't like the idea of an armory. It's just like, oh, I don't, my class doesn't define me. I just have a weapon and I change it. That's silly. And then I realized, no, you have gear sets. So it's literally like you are just, it cuts out the part of, like in 14 where you had, or in 11, where if I recall, you had to go back to your mog house to change your class, right? Right. Yeah, so there was that, you couldn't functionally change your class. Whereas this is more like Final Fantasy Tactics, where... Anytime you're not in combat, you're like, well, I'm going to swap my class real quick. And so, like, you're like, oh, what do I have over here? I'll swap here. I'll swap here. And what did it for me is I was get, I wanted to play with Rob the next day, but I had already played with Mike. So I said, all right, I'll build a new character. So I built a new character. And then I said, wait, why am I doing that? I, I don't have to. So I went and I ran. I got to level 10. And I did the quest to unlock the armory system. And then I was like, holy crap. I could just go unlock other classes and all my progress carries over. So I went and just unlocked a couple other classes because that was there. And I was like, oh, this is really cool. I'll try out a pugilist while I'm standing here kind of waiting. Mm -hmm. Oh, man, that's really cool. And then I was like, wait, I'm a pugilist, and I leveled up my conjure. I have cure. I can slot cure, and now I'm a pugilist that can heal myself. I'm like, what? Yeah, and that, the, the ease of that system comes across in the gear sets because Final Fantasy XIV originally had that idea where it was like, okay, you can be whatever class you want to be, but it was incredibly held back by the fact that switching your gear was so cumbersome. Mm -hmm. So in Realm Reborn, they made this awesome feature where you can literally save gear sets and it's as easy as like two clicks you click your gear sets and you click this the gear set you want to equip and you are instantly another class ready to right. do something else and you don't even have to do that you can actually click and drag your gear sets to the hot bar so literally i had my four classes that i was using on the hot bar and i was just and you can like, just switch between them and the, yeah. the limitation there is that you can't do it in combat but i think that's great because it it gives everybody a defined role because I think it would be really chaotic if everybody was switching between all of their classes in the middle of a fight. Bunch and, of paradigm shifts in the middle yeah. of a Final Fantasy fight. And then actually, fight. that brings me to um, the... Oh, crap. What was I going to say? I'm sorry, Derek. It brings me to something. Brings me Maybe to it'll something. bring me back in a second. Uh, shoot. What takes oh, okay, me okay. Back? I remembered. Uh, so in Final Fantasy XI, one of the big problems was that once you hit endgame... The only ways that you could con continue to develop your character were to get new equipment and to do merits, which eventually you ran out of merits to put into your character, so you had to just go for equipment. And Final Fantasy XI really focused on side grades. Like, oh, here's a, here's a piece that enhances my cure potency by 4%, so I have to macro this in. I have to create a macro to use this. Every time I cast cure, I want this piece equipped. And I hated it because... Part of it was it was annoying to have to collect all of those different items and have all of them on hand at any given time. And also because when you macro them in in, in Final Fantasy XI, your character blinked out of existence briefly and then blinked back in with the new equipment on, mm. which is how most MMOs do. But I felt like that really broke immersion and it irritated me because in high-level play, you just see people macroing and it's like they're blinking, blinking, blinking all the time. And it just seems so weird and unnatural. <laughs> so in, four, in 14, you can't change your equipment during battle so part of that is the aesthetic is is cool for aesthetics because you don't have to see people blinking in and out of existence but the other part of that that i think is more significant is that you can focus on you you need to plan your gear before you get into combat and once yeah. you're in combat you're locked into that gear set and i actually like that because you can't change your equipment while you're fighting in real life Right. Not it, that it you just, fight in real life that it often. Just feels, or need like it's, it's less irritating to me, and I like the idea of having to, to like, the your gear planning being included in your strategy for any given fight. I like that. Yeah, especially considering that later on you unlock the materia system, and, you know, your the gear customization, and, like, because of all the skills and traits you get, it really is, like, you really can, like, you could do, uh, like, with the Conjurer, they get that one... Um, the cleric stance that swaps your mind for your intelligence. So how you build your character with your stats and stuff is relevant. So it's not like, oh, hey, I can just switch anything anytime. And you can change your class anytime, but you do get a 30-second cooldown on your skills. So you can't be like, like, you can't 
see a guy running up to you and be like, oh, I'm going to quickly switch and be able to fight. It's like, no, you there's you have to at least plan it a few seconds in advance. It, it seems like the flexibility is there so that you can easily do what things like Steven was mentioning, where he can quickly join up with me. Maybe I'm playing a certain character class. He wants to augment me well or exactly. vice versa. And that that friendliness is something that I find so incredible awesome. about this game because with final fantasy 11 one of the reasons i didn't play it is because a lot of people said like this is an old school mmo like mm-hmm. it's very in-depth it's very you know not friendly in a lot of ways it's very grindy and at some point you need to party up with people because if you're just a white mage then guess what you ain't exactly going to be slaughtering squirrels for experience so right. it, with 14 it it does it feels more like wow But it still has that Final Fantasy feeling, and I think that that's so important where, like, I don't give a crap about the WoW world, I don't give a crap about Warcraft, but I like Final Fantasy, and I like this old-school Final Fantasy vibe that this game has going on. I love airships, I love the black mages with their, you know, hats. Awesome pointy hat. Yeah, I love that stuff, and that feels so prevalent here that that DNA is there to make it feel different from other MMOs, even though I think this game is doing a lot of things that other MMOs have done, like the the fates, these quests that arise that anyone can join up in and battle with. We've seen those in other MMOs, but here they feel very, very good. They feel like they're a cohesive part of the world, and I really like that. That's a really great way to put it, is that lots of MMOs have this stuff but everything feels like it fits in together here. Like, I everything because of how your character progression is set up. It's I never ever once felt like I was wasting my time. It was like, oh, my friend Brian's over there. I'm gonna run over there. Oh, he's level two. Let me switch down to my level three class. Or oh, hey, Rob's Matt, my Mike is over there. He's level ten. I'll switch back up. And it's like, oh, well, we'll do a fate. Well, all right. And then Mike's like, well, I really want to level my 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 gladiator because I want to be a paladin. And I'm like, oh, okay. So we would like take quests on and then get into fights and I'd be a little bit higher level. So he'd switch to his lower level. I'd support him and he could level up his lower level class. And then when we went to turn in the quest, he'd switch back to the original class that he was when he took it and turn it in. So it's it's like the game encourages you to just do whatever you want. The the level sync system plays into that friendliness and ease of play. Because if you are with your friend and you're much higher level than them, you don't even have to switch your class. You can just sync your level to theirs. And the same thing happens, like, if you join a fate that's lower level than you are, if you want to actually reap the, reap the benefits. Yeah, there's a button that you literally just click it, and you're synced. It's that easy to do anything with anyone. It, yeah. it's, it syncs your level, or you can change your class. I mean, in 11, it would happen, like, if your friends were playing and they got higher level than you, then you were screwed, because A, leveling was really slow, and B, for a long time, there was no way to, to compensate for that. They eventually did introduce the level sync feature, but it was a little bit more cumbersome than it is in uh, 14. Yeah, like other games have had level sync. Like, I, I don't think WoW has it, but I think Lord of the Rings had it. I can't remember. They've had it, but it, it wasn't to the benefit of the person sinking down. It was like you weren't getting anything out of it because you weren't getting good experience. It was just, yeah, you can party up with your friend, but you're not going to get anything out of it. Whereas in ele- in 14, it just it felt like everything I did was building my character, and I, I just love that. That's that's what I loved about Tactics and Final Fantasy V. I don't love Final Fantasy V overall, but it just everything I do feels like it's building my character up. Yeah, yeah, I love it. I'm and the world again. The world, yes. Ugh. I think that's the the greatest asset Final Fantasy fourteen has is it has an incredibly interesting world with really vibrant, unique designs and freaking phenomenal music. Oh God, yeah. the music is just as soon as the first like battle music started up i was like wow this is the best battle music i've heard out of final fantasy in oh i don't All know time. 15 years there's like and not only are there a lot of battle themes uh, the main battle theme in each of the three areas surrounding the main cities is the same song but played with different instruments to reflect the oh, local i noticed that that was, that is so, so cool, cool. Oh my god! The, the town i haven't been to i i've i played the phase two of the beta with derek a little bit well for like 10 seconds but uh, I played that one, and I was in Gridania, the foresty area, and then I was in Uldah this time, which I'm pretty sure is going to be my jam, because Uldah is awesome. It's like Rabinaster. It's like this really vibrant-looking, deserty place, and I haven't been to Linsa Lominsa, Lim- Lim- whatever. I can't believe one. you can pronounce all this stuff. Then we'll get to that in a second, because I can't pronounce a <laughs> but damn thing in this game. It, it, when I, I was watching the, the, like, the world tour video, and I heard the song in the one town I haven't been, and I was like, I think I have to be in that town. They have the best music. <gasps> Yeah, the music is unbelievable. Somebody asked me on Twitter, um, 
you know, is, if the music's good, maybe I'll look into it. And I was like, look, I seriously, I'm not hyperbolizing here. This is the best music I've heard from Final Fantasy in I don't know how long. Like, every song I hear, like, I'm all, it, like I ran places just to hear the music. Yep. Uh, when I was playing with Steven and Mike, we, we went through specific areas just so that we could hang out and listen to the music. It's so good. Yeah. Well, we I, are very excited about Final Fantasy XIV. <laughs> I, and I never thought we would be. Uh, uh, the other thing that really surprised me, and it, it's going to sound like a complaint, but it's not really, is that the world building is so intricate that when I, when I went up to get some quests you get like this wall of text and they explain like, Hey, this is why I need your help. This is what needs to be done. And the text is so intricate that it's almost difficult to read because it's not like a quick, Hey dude, go kill five squirrels for me. It's like, Oh my God, you know, my wife with, with the things and the, Oh, she's been bugging me. about this, that, And then I gotta, I gotta go and I gotta do this. And there's a real lushness to the world that I wasn't expecting. So at first I was like, Whoa, I, I'm like, I'm playing with a controller on the PC, which I got to say, the PC controls are pretty good with a controller. It, it works okay. I think there's some stuff that they can work on here and there, but overall, it's really good. But I found myself, like, leaning into the computer screen, like, I actually want to read that. But it was so, like, surprising to me. Whereas with Guild Wars, I was like, where am I? Okay, what do I need to do? All right, You're let's like, do it. All this. right, bad guys, got it. Got it. Bandits, they be, they be dead bandits now. Well, and that's another thing that it, it does. Other games have put effort into their writing. I don't want to put slights on that. Like Lord of the Rings Online, they did put some effort into their writing. But because of how they've set up these little storylines within each area, I just, I don't know. Like, again, I'm sure somebody could point out another MMO that has done this, but I haven't played one that's done that and made me care. Like, there's an area called the Silver Bazaar where there's this whole little plot arc where you're helping this kind of struggling market get back on its feet and get out from underneath these people that are trying to basically demolish it. So, Every quest I did, I was like, oh, this is cool. I understand how this ties into the storyline. So, like, you really do see your character as a hero because in the main plot line, I, I think as it, as it shakes out, you're one of the Warriors of Light because when the version 1.0 ended, a, like, a moon hit the planet and Bahamut came out and just dropped everything. And some super wizard teleported everybody away or, like, into, like, somewhere. I don't know how exactly the, the specifics of it work. Yeah, but he teleported you. He, the chosen people or the Warriors of Light or whatever, he teleported them to the future. Which yeah, is all the great. Get, it's five years later. Yeah. 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 And so you're those characters again arriving in the world. And so you're the people who have who can save the world. So it really makes you feel like a hero as opposed to I'm a dude who just picked up five tomatoes for you. Yep. And I like that. And the fact that the it's not implemented yet, but when the game launches, the main storyline is going to be fully voiced. It's it's got actual production values. I mean, the entire game has really great production values, but I don't know that a lot of MMOs would put that much effort into presenting a story, but it's Final Fantasy, and they want to make it feel like a Final Fantasy. They want you to be engaged in this storyline while you're playing and not just feel like you're doing quest after quest after quest after quest, which is so cool. I love it. Yeah. I love it. I will be pre-ordering it, and I never thought I would hear myself say that. So, hey. Neither did the audience. I didn't either. Yeah. Hey, Square Enix. I'm glad. Good on you guys. Like, <laughs> No, seriously, you know how I was selling this game to people? Even people who – like my friend Brian, he listens to the podcast, and I said to him, I go – he goes, well, how's New 14? I'm like, Rob likes it. And he's like, really? I'm like, yeah. And he was like, wait, really? And I'm like, yeah, Rob likes it. It's I, I Final Fantasy. Steven told John that Rob likes it, and John's response via text message was just no. No. <laughs> <laughs> but now I, I will say that I am – I'm worried about the game. Apparently, they've hit about a million beta subscribers, which is really good. It's going to have a subscription model. I'm not trying to be a Debbie Downer, but I do agree with the statement that Steven made at the start of the discussion, which is I think Square Enix, they've done a good job of establishing that this is a new game. This isn't Final Fantasy XIV with a new coat of paint. This is an entirely new game, but they need to do more because I will I agree. be pissed. I will be pissed pissed if people just go oh well 14 sucked and i'm not going to give this one a fair shot they need to get the word out that hey guys i, I wouldn't have even called it 14 honestly i i wouldn't have called it 14 i would have well, got think, as well, far away from i, think, the, I don't I think, think the problem is have... that it is 14 though like it's still people who bought 14 still own this game yeah right it is 14. and i i don't think they want to have a numbered final fantasy title in the, in the the history of the series that's just a known piece of crap well, I mean, they, they don't have, want to have that on them. No, I mean, they have eight. What are you talking about? <laughs> people people like eight. People don't universally revile eight, though. I, no, I, I, think, 
I, everybody think, has their tastes with Final Fantasy games, but but Final Fantasy XIV was legitimately broken in several ways. It was technically fundamentally unsound. So that's yeah. different than pe- not liking the story or whatever. So and I, too- I think what's really going to help with your concern too, Rob, <laughs> is that um, first of all, the betas seem to. I mean, maybe it's just where I've been reading, but I've been reading a lot of really positive impressions just from people that have been trying the beta, like on Twitter or like, you know, various like news outlets and stuff. People are like, wait, this is actually pretty good. Like everybody seems to be having a similar reaction, which is, wait, 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 this is good. What? Me too. But oh my God, stay away from the official beta forums. Stay away. It's pretty much, it's not as hard as 11. It sucks. But the the beta forums are absolutely toxic. They're, you know what uh, though? It, it, you know what though? The best way to put it: every community and every type of game has its elite people who are exclusionary and want things to be as esoteric as possible. Like, there's the hardcore fighting game community. Not to not to disparage it, but there are people in that community that don't want other people involved in it, and yeah. they want that because it, because I understand partially where they're coming from. Final Fantasy XI was so difficult, but it was such a unique take on the formula that the people who did spend time with it, it is a really important memory to them. And they had really great times, and they feel like by this changing, it's not going to be, it's not going to live up to their nostalgia, which I think is not going to work anyway. But I also think that the game going open beta in July is another good thing for it because people will play it and be like, "Whoa, wait, what?" Oh, I can't wait for it. Like I, I'm pissed. You know, I, I I know why they're doing it, but the only being able to play it on the weekends really bummed me out. <laughs> and now, but now I've reached a point where it's like I don't want to play it anymore. I'm like, you know what? I'm playing it when it comes out. So I'm just—I don't even think I'm going to play it until for sure we're not going to get our characters wiped, which I think is the plan for Phase Four, correct? Yes. Which is, uh, rumor has it that since people have been saying you'll be able to turn in your closed beta codes until like July 17th, people are expecting the open beta to be like end of July, early August, and that has been barring a huge catastrophe they've said that your data will transfer to the full game there so what will happen is phase four will happen that's going to have everything implemented if i recall uh player housing or the housing system the pvp system uh all the uh the the duty finder next weekend it comes up and like the cross world thing and the level sync will be up and then phase four will go offline a few weeks before release people with early access will get access and then it will launch and all of your data from Phase 4 will carry you over. We're still missing some character classes, right? Like, we're missing the Scholar and the Arcanist? Yeah, the, the Arcanist is a base class that can turn into either the Summoner job or the Scholar job. Oh, really? I yeah. thought the Ar- Oh, I thought Arcanist was a, another, like, specialized job. No, it's a base, it's a base class. Oh, okay, cool. And I, I'm interested to see, like, what does the Summoner play like? What does yeah, the, the Scholar play like? Like, yeah, I, we, the, we don't know. The summoner is like a, I'm not really sure. It's some kind of offensive mage that channels like mini spirit versions of the primals, which are the main like Ifrit, Ifrit, Shiva, Garuda, and then the scholar Doom Train is a is a party. Yes. Yeah, I wish Doom Train. Yeah. Oh Doom my god. Train. Speaking of which, there are train tracks in in Thanalan, and if you can ride on a train, I'm gonna selfie freak out. But anyway, yeah. the I, know. Scholar, I agree. Scholar summons <laughs> scholar summons fairies to buff and support. It, it's, it didn't say much, but it's on the, the official website. I don't know. Cool. All I know is, is I can play my Siren from Borderlands. I can do damage, and I can heal. And that's all I want to do. I'm going to be a summoner. I'm probably going to be a paladin, I think. Okay. There, there's no, one. like, sneaky rogue class, so I don't really have something there. Yeah, they'll, Not there's, yet. A, there's a musketeer's guild, but there's no musketeer class yet, and it's all but confirmed that they're going to add it in, like, a couple patches down the line. Which so means you mus- can be Mustadio. I, you could I, be Mustadio. I'm going to be a musketeer. It's, could, it's like it's a gun class. OK, I, I was sitting here going M-I-C-K-E-Y-M-O-U-S-E. That's a musketeer, Rob. And oh, we actually made E-O-R-Z-E-A. a reference to Z-E-A. We, we made His a reference to the so Mickey good. Mouse Club in our last podcast when we recorded yeah, we the encounter. Oh, God. We sure so, did. <laughs> overall, uh, 14, I am super high on it. You know, I'm a little, I'm a little wary because I don't know how. Do you have to? Do you have to end? Can you, can you no, just no, no, say, no, 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 I'm no. really excited about this game? Well, would you stop? It wouldn't be me if I wasn't. I don't know if this game is going to hold my attention that long, but I am going to pick it up. I'm going to play it with you guys, and I'm excited to play it. I'm glad yeah. to hear that. I just don't know if like at, the only games that I really played religiously for a long period of time were primarily shooters like SOCOM, uh, Left 4 Dead, and Modern Warfare. Those were the only games that, like, I played for a whole year, like, 
couple hours every other night. I don't know if I'm going to do it with this, but I know that if any game is going to make me do it, it's going to be this one. Yeah, that's you know I agree. That's that's how I feel because again, I still I'm 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 jaded MMO guy, but I feel like if I'm gonna like because I mean I the only games I've put that many hours into recently are Borderlands and Left 4 Dead. So yeah, I I, I suspect this is kind of what I've been wanting to play, and with all you guys playing, I don't really think that's going to be. But it could end up being like Guild Wars, where everyone said they were going to play it, and then no one did. Uh, well, it's not going to happen with me. It's not going to happen with me Fantasy here. I've played Fantasy XI for, what, now, eight years? Good lord. So, I'm, I was, I'm I was worried to... about Guild Wars. I was worried about Guild Wars from the moment I played the beta, because I was like, wait, I have all my skills. I've been playing for an hour. I remember trying to talk my buddy into getting a hard drive for our PlayStation 2 so we could play Final Fantasy XI. I remember those days. Yep. <laughs> okay, so Final Fantasy fourteen, pretty awesome. Definitely check it out. I, I, I implore you people, like, I get it. I get that fourteen was kind of broken, kind of busted, but, you know, try the beta. Just try the beta and see what you think. And I, I think a lot of people are going to be surprised. I agree. I was. So, okay, Final Fantasy fourteen, yay, and Elder Scrolls Online, nay. <laughs> We we are setting the internet straight here. We I I don't know what anybody sees in that. I <laughs> I'm not the right person to ask about it though because I'm not an Elder Scrolls fan anyway. You know what? I it just not looks a like the most the most generic genericness that ever generic and generic down. I don't give a damn. Well, that's that that no. You know what? That's honestly my issue is that I never felt attached to those worlds. I'm like yes, I, I've said this a million times. There's lore in that world, yes, but a lot of lore doesn't mean it's good lore. And lore or not, the game, I mean, I suppose somebody in the other side of the camp could say, well, Final Fantasy fourteen is just basically wow with the Final Fantasy world. And I'm like, yeah, I guess you could say that. The only difference is I saw Tiso and it made me feel like, oh, look, an MMO. I hate those. And I saw fourteen and I went, huh. That's a Final I, Fantasy game. Yeah. So maybe, maybe there's an audience for it. I know people have given it awards and said it looks great, but none of us here have really been all that keen on it. It's pretty much an MMO. Well, all I know is that playing 14 made me feel like I was playing Xenoblade, and that's maybe the best compliment I can give it. <laughs> Where I was just like, I'm going to go find stuff to do! <laughs> like, that's what I was doing for quite a while. literally what I was... I was like, I'm going to walk in that direction for a while. And you Ooh. can. Now, if only we could get that guitar solo into that game. Anywho, sorry. Alright, so, my 3DS has been getting quite the workout lately. And Teenage. I know, I'm going to get Brain Age for Jackie, I promised her. But here's the deal. If I had played Virtue's Last Reward last year, that would have probably been my game of the year. <laughs> that's that's what I said. I, I played it in, like, I got it for Christmas, and I played it in January, so I couldn't give it an award. But I finished it, and I was like, damn. I go, three months sooner, and this would have been my game of the year. Good lord. Like... You want to talk about wacky, crazy, intense, tension-filled, golly, I'm just so happy playing this game. Even when I get really mad at it, I love it. I just love it. So Virtue's Last Reward is the sequel to 999, uh, Zero Escape, Nine Hours, Nine Persons, Nine Doors. I think that was the title. I just call it 999. Uh, And this is the sequel released on Vita and 3DS. And it, it is a total sequel. There are parallels. There are things going on. Don't worry, we're not going to spoil anything. And it's a visual novel with puzzle-solving elements. And this game just freaking rocks. It is just... I, I We talked about it before, and so I don't want to spend too much time on it. But golly, if you have not picked up Virtue's Last Reward, and you are even remotely interested in a visual novel or puzzle games or just awesome narrative that can only be done in a video game... Please play this game. Just please. It's so good. Please. Yes. I is. agree with those things. I don't know what to, I don't know what we can really say about it that we A haven't already said and B wouldn't be a spoiler, but it's it's one <laughs> of the most interesting narratives I've ever experienced in a video game, and it's the kind of narrative that can only be presented through a game. Exactly. And yeah. that, that to me is what makes it special. And, you know, I, I, I did say that the game has pissed me off a little bit. I think a, a couple of puzzles have been a little hit and miss. Some of their explanations maybe could be a, a little better. But with the amount of translation that went into this game, this game is huge. Like 999, I, I conquered that whole game, every ending in what, like maybe 12, 13 hours. 
I'm at like hour 15 on this game. I still have like two thirds to go. And you can't even, no, you have two thirds to go and then more paths are going to open up. Literally, I, I finished that game with like 43 hours and I was like, wow, that was very long. Yeah, and it doesn't get old. Like, the way the game just delivers story and it keeps the intrigue going. And yeah, it's completely insane. Like, th- this game this game has reached a level where they throw a plot twist at me and they're like, yeah, I'll buy that. I can, <laughs> I can believe that. Because this game's nuts. And I just love it. it it's just so... Ah, Save glitch and everything on 3DS, which I did run into, but thankfully it didn't corrupt my data. <coughs> told you that. <coughs> Dude, I, I... Told you not to save in that room. No, no, no. You told me that there was a save glitch, and then... And that, I, sa- I, I said, there's a puzzle room, there's a save glitch, make sure you find out which one it is before you go save it in puzzle yeah, rooms. Yeah, you were right, you were right, you were right, but luckily it didn't It didn't corrupt my save, but this game, ah, uh, ah, uh, mm, mm, mm. I like good games. Now, if we can only get Dragon Quest Seven on 3DS... Wait, what? Which one? The... The, they, uh, the, Dragon Quest Seven got released on 3DS last year, and they haven't said anything about it being in America. And I really, really want it. Like this, this is why I have a portable system. Thank you again, everyone. This is why I have a portable system because I like the kinds of games that are on portable systems, and it, it's really fun to like sit on the couch and play, and be able to close it and come back to it. And I really like that. And Final Fan and uh, Final Fantasy Seven. Dragon Quest Seven is a game that I always wanted to play, and we don't know if we're getting it in America. So I'm kind of like, please? I would be utterly shocked if we didn't get it. They've released every other port here, and they like money. <laughs> yes, they do. And, and we just and hey, they just confirmed my little thinking that we were going to get Dragon Quest Ten on PC. Where's the Rob was right T-shirt? I'm looking around for it. I don't because you all were like, no, they're never going to release it on PC. Were we? Yeah. Did we? Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Well, you're right then. Although they haven't said if they're going to release it here. Well, now if it's on PC, I think you got a much better shot of it being released in America. I can see that. Much I, better. Well, you shot. know what, though? Square Enix has even been saying lately, they're like, oh, we're building Final Fantasy 15 on a PC and then downspecking it for the consoles. And we're willing to consider for any platform that uses DirectX, which I believe there's three of those. It's called consoles. Well, I don't know. And P- they're basically saying, yeah, we're considering doing it on PC. I would be very not surprised to see almost all of their big budget games coming to PC in the next couple of years. I wouldn't be surprised if Kingdom Hearts uh, 15, uh, you, Dragon Quest already is. I wouldn't be surprised to see all of them coming to PC. I agree. And I think that's lovely. I agree. And uh, to get back to the 3DS real quick, I'm really happy that they that the Nintendo eShop is much... Uh, it's much more uh, developed than I thought it was, where it's much easier to go online and buy games. And I really like that, so I'm not going to be sitting here. If I decide to play Fire Emblem a year from now, I'm not going to go, wow, I really need to track down a copy. Hey, I can just buy it off the eShop. That said, I, I hate to do this, but... And I know why they don't have, like, Super Metroid on the 3DS, because they would have to redesign it with the dual screens in mind. But come on. Just... Well, I, I don't think Come it's on. that. I don't think it's that. I think it's they're trying to create some sort of specific features for each one. Like they, the you can't get Virtual Console Super Nintendo games on 3DS. It's handheld games that you can get. It's, why? It's, why? And I, I, I don't agree with it. I understand why they're doing it because if they said, oh, we use Got Earthbound on a Virtual Console, but also 3DS. Well, everybody has a 3DS, or most it's people already do. Yeah. So they're not going to go buy a Wii U for it then. So I see what they're doing, but I wish they wouldn't do that. What I wish they would do is what Sony does, where if there's a game that's available on both platforms, generally speaking, if you buy it on one, you get it on the other with Vita and PS3. There are exceptions, but you know there's a lot more I mean, parity it, between them. It sounds like I'm crying over nothing. Like, hey, Steinman, you can buy like all these games on the 3DS. What's your, what are you complaining about? But it's just like Steven saying, like, I want to play Earthbound. And I have a 3DS. I don't want a Wii U. And I, you're not going to entice me to buying... Maybe that's just me. But you're not going to entice me to buying a Wii U with old Super Nintendo games. Whereas... Although, although you might, are with X and Sonic Lost World. But we've already discussed that. But I might be more enticed to buy like a 3DS, which has a lot of games that I'm interested in. Especially if I can get things like Earthbound on it. So I, I don't know. That to me is just one of those like... It's a weird thing, but I agree with Steven. I get why they're doing it. It just really... I, I, I understand their thinking. I just don't like it. Did you guys see the message board postings about people getting stuck on the first red door in Super Metroid? Why can't Metroid what? crawl? <laughs> <laughs> 
That's the thing people said. I think I think that was a troll account. Because like later it, on, right. that that same oh. guy. Do you know about this? The guy that was posting draw or pictures on Meverse. Oh yeah, saying, I remember. I saying saw stuff it. like, "Why can't Metroid crawl?" <laughs> and later later on, he find he finds the Metroid. Then he says, "Hey guys, I found Samus." <laughs> oh, so God. so I think it had to be a joke, but it but was the, pretty. But funny. the people getting stuck on the first like five missile red door that just made me happy. Like kids, you don't know how good you have it today. Back in the day, we just we just had to burn every bush with a red candle and just pray to God we found a set of stairs. <laughs> yep. You guys don't know how lucky you got it. So, uh, love my 3DS. So, Derek, tell me a little bit about Project X Zone. Uh, Cross Zone. Project Cross Zone. I'm sorry. Is that it, really? Is that how we're supposed yeah, to refer to everything that has is. an X in it? it well, this. I so, guess. Mega Man Cross. Oh. Well, there is that Mega Man crossover phone game that's supposedly but. <laughs> but anyway, X it is. Over I guess it's supposed three, to be five, Project over Cross two. Zone. <laughs> but uh, Project Cross Zone is a pretty cool game. I, it's the kind of game that I didn't expect to ever come out here because it's so full of fan service and characters that I thought they would never be able to get the licensing needed to bring it out here. I guess they did have to cut out a few of the songs that were from games like the. Yuri and Estelle from Tales of Vesperia are in the game, and they had to cut out Ring a Bell. Oh, really? Was, uh, oh, because yeah, it was only little... licensed. Yeah, so, and there was a couple other instances like that. But basically, it's if you've played Super Robot Tyson, Uji Saga, Endless Frontier, which I guess not a lot of people probably have, but it's got a similar combat system in that basically you just have... Okay, so this is... It's like a strategy RPG, but when you engage an enemy, you go into a little skirmish. And you execute attacks, you'll have up to five available eventually. And they're just really ridiculously flashy attacks that juggle enemies in the air and do all kinds of crazy stuff. Uh, they all throw back to the original games that these characters are from. Uh, I guess that maybe I should have backed up a little bit by saying that this is like a... The story is not meant to make sense. This is a crossover game where all the characters are here from different worlds. You've got Mega Man, you've got Tales of Vesperia, God Eater... Uh, Everything. Uh, no Sonic. Fighting game characters. Yeah, Sega. they've got like Virtua Fighter, Tekken, Street Fighter. Why, no why do they have Sonic? Well, they actually, they do have Sega. You're right. They have Ulala from Space Channel 5. They have Valkyria Chronicles. So this game is meant to just be fun fan service, I think. And the, it has a plot, but the plot is basically like all these worlds are blurring together and we have to fight the bad guys. So <laughs> Is the plot don't... literally... The, yeah, so I was going to say... The evil universe blurring bad guy is there. We have to stop him and then return yeah, to our that, worlds. That's all it is. And and characters say lines that are somewhat relevant to their worlds. Or but but like every character will have one line in a pre-battle conversation. Like every character will pop up and say one thing, and they'll be like, "We have to fight them." And Frank West from Dead Rising will show up and be like, "Yes," and I have to take a picture of them. I covered wars. <laughs> right. So, but anyway, so the skirmishes are just like basically you're stringing together combos and trying to juggle enemies. It's really flashy. It's really fun. It's cool so long as you keep getting new characters, but I think I, I'm still at the point. I'm not at the point yet where I've stopped getting new characters, but I can see it getting annoying because skirmishes are really, really big. Like you'll have over 30 enemies on the map at any given time. And when you fight them, you go into a little individual fight and it takes a little bit. It's not awful, but it, it's just starting to get tedious because I'm doing the same attacks over and over. But but anyway, it's the sprite work and is out of this world pretty it's got such cool animations for all the attacks i don't really know it's it's the kind of game that i feel like if you buy it you already know what you're getting and you'll probably really like it i i like it a lot but i i don't think i'm gonna be enjoying it once we get close to the end just because i'll be like all right i've seen all the characters i've seen all their quotes i've seen all their attacks and now i'm just ready to be done so you don't have mega man yet so i do not have mega man yet i just got yuri and estelle so and i'm on like chapter 15 or 14 so derek if you had to choose between this and Fire Emblem, which would you pick? Um, I think Fire Emblem has more depth. And Fire Emblem is probably the better game. But, I don't know. I, Steven and I seem to be the only people in the universe that are not... We don't... Well, I don't know about Steven. I don't hate Fire Emblem Awakening. I just wasn't as sweet on it as everybody else seems to be. But I would say Fire Emblem between the two, Sure. I was just looking for controversy. Steven, tell us how, why you hate Fire Emblem. I've said why I hate Fire Emblem, and I don't hate Fire Emblem. I just recognize... You know. <laughs> All right, let me rephrase that. I hate Fire Emblem, but I don't say it is a bad game. It feels meaningless, 
And I feel like the only reason it's popular is because you can ship lots of characters because there's no depth whatsoever to any of them. There's just a lot of interaction. It's just not good. And just you take off the permadeath and it's like, oh, yeah, look, now I can blunt force the whole game. There's literally no challenge, which people, which is good. It's accessible. But I don't know. I just I don't have any impetus to go on. I'm like, I don't like any of these characters because they're all just jokes and cliches. And it's like, oh, the localization is so good because they dumped in a bunch of references to Game of Thrones and other things that I like on the Internet. I mean, I feel like it's just appealing to the Tumblr crowd. Okay, Project can... Cross Zone has a little bit of that as well, but it's more just like, hey, remember when this character did this in their game? They're going to do it again. D- uh-huh. is, is Dante in the game? And Desi goes, yeah. I'll, fill, I'll fill your heart with light! Uh, no, he, but he does talk about eating pizza, and <laughs> when he fights, he says, Show <laughs> Dundra! Is it young Dante, or is it uh, not young Dante? It's normal. It's normal uh, age Dante. Nipples Dante, or not nipples Dante? Not nipples Dante. Uh, what nipple, a shame. Nipples McDante? Uh, Dante Nipples lady up from from Dimitri or with Dimitri from Darkstalkers, which is kind of a, an interesting combo. I want to get Laharl Dimitri in a devil, there. Uh, Laharl's not in. Oh, poop. Who else is in there? It's, I, a, it's a fun game. It's uh, give me Mega just Man some crazy Zero. people that are in there. Uh, Mega Man and Zero. Yeah, Mega Man and Zero, Shenko from Darkstalkers, and Frank West are a combo. Uh, I already went through a bunch of them. Um, God Eater. Akira and Pi from Virtua Fighter. Uh, I thought you meant like actual Akira was in the game. I was like, really? No. Uh, Morrigan and <laughs> Chun- Morrigan from Darkstalkers and Chun Li. Shoot, I don't know. It, tons. There's there's like a there's a listing of them you can get online. Some of the craziest ones that I didn't expect were like Ulala from Space Channel Five. Like I said, I was like what is she doing in there? Does that mean Michael Jackson's in there too? Space Michael, I wish. Space, Space Michael is yeah. he wearing boxing gloves like ready to rumble? Are you guys talking about Michael Jackson's Moonwalker, the old Genesis game? No. Because that no. game was awesome. No, Michael Jackson was actually in Space Channel 5. He was Space in Space Channel, Channel 5. 5. Yeah. He I was played Space, Space Michael- Channel 5. He's Did, you it. didn't play it right. I guess not. I don't remember uh, that at all. There's no way you could have missed him. There's no Sonic, so it's all all this discussion of who's from Steven, Sega is yeah. irrelevant. How are you... Yeah. Set, I, I, Steven, I respect you so much as a gamer. And- <laughs> a complete sonic fanboy and that aggravates me <laughs> like i'm so like uh, God. i'm not a sonic fanboy i admit yes, which you of his are. Games are bad but i also know that some of them are good like one good sonic game happens every five years no two happened in a row they were called colors and generations and the two portable ones which are totally different games which were good and the next one that's coming out is even better <sighs> lost world does look cool i just I cannot disassociate Sonic anymore from furries, and that makes me sad. <laughs> I think that's why I didn't like uh, one game. See, nice little segue here. I think that's why I don't like one game as much as Steven does. Um, and I, I don't want to talk too much about it, but I played a little bit of Dust, and I like it. And it's funny. I've actually brought that up to Steven before, and I, it's not that I, I don't want to play it. I do want to play it. I'll buy it when it goes on sale on Steam. But I've been I've told Steven that. I'm a little bit put off because I see the main characters and I just think furry. And I know that's not what it what it's about. It's no, not... no, they definitely are furry. Like, the girls have... You have a fox. No, no, no. At, Derek isn't at... referring to they are just designed as furries. Derek is referring to furry subculture. Oh, well, yeah. I, I mean, I don't... I, I don't know, but I don't think that the characters were designed to be, like, furry fetish designs. No, I think it, they were just designed that way because anthropomorphic animals are family-friendly and... Right. Just based on what I've seen from the developer, it's stri- he strikes me as the type that's going to make family-friendly c- games that are friendly to everybody. Like, don't think of it as creepy furry stuff. Think of it as, oh, this is a Saturday morning cartoon about animals. Like, yeah, no, that that's that. fine. But then, like, the really obnoxious Navi-type character just needs to shut the hell up. Kyle didn't like her either. I thought she was amusing. The, the, well, you like puns, and that that's all I, I got to say. I, I, I do like puns. like puns. I like hilariously and bad like, ones, especially. You know, one guy made this game, so I, I give it a lot of respect, and I would love to see a sequel with a little bit more development, but, like, the combat to me is very repetitive. The, the world and the just the exploration element of the game really isn't there. I, I was telling Steven earlier today, I think the camera is way too zoomed in to the point where, like, I can't even see where the edges of the screen are. So I end up just kind of jumping around like a nitwit, like trying to find... It's very much in that Metroidvania style. And the game's combat is much more interesting than a Metroidvania where all you do is just swing your sword. 
it kind of puts Dawn of Sorrow to shame, which I played a couple months back. But it, it's got some really, really good ideas, but I'm not as in love with it as I think some people are. I think I, I'm i a little bit more down on it, but I really respect what this one guy so, was able to do. I, I don't are you think... trying to segue into Muramasa, by the way? No, I was trying to segue into Dust and then into Muramasa. Oh, okay. Well, Thanks, Dust, Derek. I, I enjoyed Dust. I thought it, it didn't overstay its welcome because I did think at the end it was getting a little repetitive. But again, for the price of the game and how nice it looks, I enjoyed it fully. And I think, you know, if you like an action RPG, it's worth playing. Um, you know, the again, it's made by one guy. And I don't like to make that an excuse, but it's impressive on that front. And that it's enjoyable, I think, is still good. It, it is repetitive, but I think that's simply because you don't have a whole team of people coming up with scenarios and different situations. It's, you know, there are a few different wrinkles, but, you know, working within constraints is what you get. And I think it's still a good game. I don't think it's a fantastic game, but I think it's a good game. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely don't want to disparage on an indie developer. Somebody puts their heart and soul into a game. And again, I'd like to see a sequel. It's just that it, it doesn't strike me as like, you know, Mark of the Ninja to me is like, holy crap, this is a stealth game that can go up with the best of them. It just happens to be a 2D indie developed stealth game. And is it indie? I thought it was made by like a big studio, wasn't it? Or no? no, it's made by the same guys that made Shank. So oh, I like Shank. Shank was cool. Yeah, so it's a smaller, and don't starve, uh, they're a smaller development studio. Uh, but then like Dust, it, it's not, I, I respect it, but it's not quite there. But I think it could get there. And so I, I want to see another one, and I agree with Steven. Like, check it out. You know, you can get it for pretty cheap on Steam. It's not that big of an investment. We just got done talking about how, like, I like spending $20 on a game, even if I only play it a couple times, because, you know, you go to the movies with a date, that's 20 bucks right there. If uh, if you're lucky. Yeah, if you're lucky. Uh, so, you know, it, it's good, but I, I'm not enamored with it. But it's, it's all right. It's all right. I, I can dig that. Tell me about Miramasa, because you seem to hate that game as well, Steven. I don't hate Miramasa. You hate everything. When did you become me? Oh, God. Yeah. I don't hate, I don't hate everything. I just know I know what I like. How, and how do you feel about the storyline in Heavy Rain? I like it, except <laughs> for that one part. <laughs> okay, I'm just, I'm just testing you. When you start complaining about how Madison got out of that burning apartment... Well, that... Look, there are logic gaps, but overall, I enjoyed the tale. He's becoming me, Derek. I guess so. One of us. One so, of us. Muramasa is absolutely gorgeous. The new localization is fantastic. Uh, it still has Japanese voices, and I don't think that's a fault. Some people don't like that. This is a game that you should not be listening to in English. You got dial. You got subtitles. The game is so steeped in Japanese mythology and Japanese design elements, and just it, it is. Its essence is Japanese, so to hear it in English would be wrong. And I, I, I don't say that normally because there are lots of things I like to see in a dub. Like, I like Persona better in English. But in this game, you should be listening to it in Japanese. And for me, understanding Japanese, there's a lot of really cool depth that they put into the translation that I can appreciate. So it is categorically a better translation than the old one on Wii. It's beautiful on the Vita. It's beautiful in general. The design is great, and now that it's looking, it's in HD. It just looks even better. Music is fantastic. It fits super well. It's it's there's like shamisen and koto in there and stuff. It's really cool. Did Sorry, I hit, mute. I hit mute. Sorry. Uh, and so it works from that regard. There's two characters, and basically, I guess you could say it's like a Metroidvania sort of where you run around, you fight stuff. Works a lot like Dust. Um, and there'll be different barriers throughout the world that you need to acquire. There are, like, hundreds of different demon blades. Actually, I think there's, like, 800. And they're all different swords you can get. And, you know, they all have different, like, they look different. And, you know, they can function slightly differently in terms of, like, their strength and all that. But it all works great. There's a little bit of... I, I've beaten one of the storylines. And I think it gets a little bit backtracky, even for my taste. Because I don't mind backtracking. But there's a... It gets a bit extreme. Because it'll be like, oh, hey... You're at one end of the province, and you have to run six provinces over to go unlock a gate. And it's like, well, okay. Uh, so, but core, it all sounds great on paper. So why don't I love it? I don't know. It's, no, I seem to be the only person having this problem, but I think the controls are abysmal. They added a jump button, which is great. But everything feels really deliberate. And I don't, 
maybe I just, it's just because I recently played Dust, and that is very, very, like, you hit the button and he swings his weapon super fast. You know, I, I don't know if that's it or what it is, but there's such a delay before you do anything. It's like, oh, I jump, and you kind of float up slowly, and enemies whack you, and it's like, oh, hey, you got to block that that shuriken coming at you, but you can't once it's already coming at you because your guy's going to slowly pull his sword out of his sheath and then attack. It just, I don't feel... I don't feel in control. I feel like there's just this delay before everything that's infuriating. And John was like, play it on a normal difficulty. I actually switched to normal almost immediately because I was sitting there like, ugh. So you played a a game on normal, dude. I just, I hate the controls. I really do. I think, I think maybe it was an intentional choice on their part to make it deliberate. Cause when you start moving around and flowing, it looks great, but it always feels like there's a delay before anything like, I'll be like, I want to dash over there. And then I'll be like, all right, I have a second before that's going to be reflected on the screen. So let's see what pretty things are happening on my character now. And, you know, some of the, I was told by some other people, oh, well, some of the swords are slower. I'm like, well, yeah, I know the difference between a long sword and a sword, but the regular swords are faster, but almost categorically weaker. And I don't know, it just, it, it feels like, it feels like there's this wall of fog between me and the perception of the game. So I'm like, all right, hit a button. And there's my action. I hit a button. Oh, look, I jumped. It's not like button jump. And that, that it bothers me for some reason. I don't know. Maybe it's just because I was expecting something more like dust. But, I mean, it's not a bad game. It's fun. It's definitely worth having on Vita. It's pretty. And if you can tolerate that control lag, which apparently everybody but me can, uh, don't take my word for it. Uh, it's, it's, it's a I, I really well want to done out. game. Yeah, I, I just could only afford that or Project Cross Zone. And I chose Cross Zone just because... I've played Maramasa before on Wii. It was inferior for sure. I, I really want to play the new version, but I wanted to get a game that I had never experienced before. Did, did you feel that way on Wii when you played it? Like, like there was a lot of deliberation before your attacks? Like, Yeah, a bit. Well, and I think a big part of that was the lack of a jump button that irritated the crap out of me. So I'm glad that they added that in. But but I, I agree with you that there was a little bit... There's a tiny bit of delay before you actually execute an attack, but I didn't really mind just because it felt a lot like Odin Sphere. So Yeah, I guess it's been a while since I played Odin Sphere, but Yeah, yeah so my, it's my friend is playing Odin Sphere right now. So, so I I was able to look at that and I was thinking about how it compared to Muramasa and and they are pretty similar in in the the speed of combat. Mm. Yeah, it's a good game. Um I think the vast majority will enjoy it. It's a solid action RPG, a little repetitive, a little bit of backtracking, but you could do a lot worse. Well, I I think you brought up a good point about the the animation system and the fluidity of motion. Uh, Steven and I were talking in the pre-show about how, like, I have a huge problem with games that are in love with their own animation systems to the point where I press a button and the action that I wanted to perform doesn't happen quickly enough. Like, the, the example I brought up was in the uh, the Batman games, uh, Arkham, City and, uh, uh, Arkham City and Arkham Asylum. There's one specific move that Batman does when he's in combat. It's like this roundhouse kick. It's called I Am The Bat. Yeah, it, it's a great move. It looks beautiful. But it's so slow compared to his other moves where he'll just, like, punch a dude real quick in the face or, like, knee a dude real quick in the chest. And if the game decides that he's going to do that roundhouse kick, which I really don't have any impact on, then I might end up getting hit in the time that it takes him to do that. Whereas if he did just the punching animation real fast, I would have been fine. And there, I'm really getting to the point where if a game is I, – I always start screaming at the television that the game is in love with its own animation system. Where I'm just like, why? Why is it taking this long to animate the action? What I wanted to do was relevant a second ago. It's not relevant now. I like don't it... want to steer this conversation away, but you know what game doesn't do that? What? Final Fantasy XIV. No. <laughs> no, it doesn't. Seriously. Know, original immediate. version 14 was was one of the, its, its biggest flaws. What you, is you were stuck in animation lock when you did stuff. So you literally had to make that part of your strategy in battles. Like when you were fighting a free, it, people would say don't use weapon skills before he does blah, blah, blah attack. Cause if you get stuck in it, you can't react fast enough to get away. Now in the new version, it's like snap you do it. And it's the animations are flashy, but they happen instantaneously and it feels very tactile. Anyway, go on. Yeah. And some games make it work. Like, you know, monster hunter is built around that and people really seem to like that, but people, not us. Yeah. I think it's the unpredictability. Like when Nathan Drake will take maybe a second longer to do something than I think he should. 
I'm like, why is he doing that? Like, I didn't, in, or I didn't anticipate Batman to do the roundhouse kick. I expected him to punch the dude in the face, and I just took damage because he did the move I wasn't expecting. And so that's that's kind of like it's the reason I love the God of War combat system so much because Kratos can break out of almost any combat animation into a block. Whereas, like in the new Devil May Cry, if you try to do the axe swing, the big giant hammer axe swing. If you start that attack, you can't stop it. You could start the attack, and an enemy winds up and hits you in the time that it took you to complete the animation. And that, you know, some games really pull it off, and I'm sure, some, I'm sure someone is going to point out one of my favorite games ever, and how that's definitely a part of that game. But, I don't know, it just it feels so much more fair in some games, and other games it doesn't. I think it's the unpredictability. Actually, I, I think if somebody points out your favorite game ever that they're they're wrong because that's actually one of my favorite parts of that game is I feel like you always are in control. Yeah, it, it's not if like... All... Ta- oh, wait, are we talking about Dark Souls? <laughs> it's I, just like... wanna, I just want to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not like uh, I'm going to swing the sword and it's going to do something different. Like, I love the fact that Batman has all these animations, but if he does something that I didn't anticipate him doing and I get hit because of it, well, that kind of... Yeah, no, I know. I, I can appreciate that. I think, I think that's just something you get with games getting more modern and production values going up. Is people expect this sort of level of flash. So, rather than because of the system for combat they built into, you know, that game in particular, it, it they have to make you only have one attack button and then you have a counter. So Batman has to do all these natural, crazy flowing moves to look cool, make him look like Batman, even though you don't have direct control over that. Whereas back in the day, it was more like you know you didn't have your character launching into this very fancy pants combo because presentation wise that wasn't expected. Right. Right. But we don't want to, we don't want to veer too far off topic. We talked about Batman for way too long on RPG fan. And I apologize for that. So, uh, before Derek gets us started on news, um, we spent a lot of time after E3 talking about the Xbox one and about all the DRM stuff. So all that stuff is gone apparently. And uh, so are the good things. Yeah. The, but you know, but, like Major, Major Nelson taking the microphone away from Major Joe, from Angry Joe, and saying, "Like, did you develop that game? Do you know how hard it is to rip out the online?" <laughs> don't. Well, don't you look like a dick now? <laughs> Don Matrick. Actually, we found out today. Don Matrick left and went to Zynga. I have a theory on that. Uh, Oops. <laughs> no, I think you know what. I think he said he goes. You know what? I know what this is going to entail. This is going to be exhausting. You know, being in this console war is going to be a tense job. I'm going to take my severance package from Microsoft. I'm going to go to Zynga. I'm going to play it like a good old capitalist. I'm going to suck as much money out of it as I can, and then I'm going to retire. I don't think he intends on being in the industry for much longer. And if I'm wrong on that in two years, by all means, point it out. But I, I, think, I think he's looking for a little nest egg and getting ready to bounce. Well, I, I don't want to get too speculative about that. I mean, he's got to do what's right for him as a person, as a career, and I'm okay with that. But now my, my question to you guys is, does this change your opinion on the Xbox One? Do you suddenly think it's okay to pick one up? I mean, I'm still... I was probably not going to get one anyway because I don't really like the Xbox One exclusives that much. I, I don't really like right. the PlayStation exact, exactly. exclusives that me. much either, but... Yeah, me, that's... It's, it's just there. like... I, I, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I would like to get one if they have cool games. That's that's it. I, I feel less like I'm being dirty if I were to buy one at this point because I can <laughs> actually sell my games. But they still don't have any anything in the way of interesting exclusives that would lure me over to buying one right away. Sure, I'll get one in the future if they make cool games, but for now it's... You didn't like four. Rise? That's kind of how I feel. No. I'm sorry. I, that, I, I feel bad beating up on that game so much. But... It looks stupid, and everyone's like, it looks incredible. I go, no, it looks like God of War, but with even less control in your hands. Hey, hey, hey. I say even less. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I think this is good that Microsoft went back. I think that the, the Xbox 180. And I think they literally did it the day we released the podcast. I'm like, dang it. But I, I'm glad that they did it. I'm still not that interested in the Xbox One exclusives, like Derek said. But more to the point, they or Mike or or Sony, for that matter, they can go back on this in a heartbeat. And that's the thing that scares me is that they could, you know, you could get a new terms of service agreement that you click agree, and guess what? All this stuff is back. And you know, you know what does it for me really though is, I feel like that that DRM stuff. That tells me what team they're playing for. They're playing for their publishing partners. And I understand it's a business. That's how it's going to work. But that doesn't mean I have to pay for it. 
So they've shown where their first priority is. They've, they came out and said, you know, the, the UI designer said, we're designing it with advertising in mind. The, you know, the, the, all the guys from Rare have left and have all but said, it's not Rare, it's just Microsoft controls Rare's IP. And they're exclusive. Every ex- I look at the previous Xbox, like the original Xbox, Xbox 360, and I think about the games I played on it, and I don't foresee there being anything on this that I need to play. Yeah. I don't see a whole lot on PlayStation 4 that I'm super interested in outside of like Infamous Second Son looks pretty cool. But, you know, I've kind of I've the kind game? of Sony Sony's exclusives have always appealed to me more and maybe it's cuz I've had more Sony consoles, but I've owned all the Microsoft consoles. I love Phantom Dust, I love Lost Odyssey, but I can think back and just name so many Sony exclusives that I really like and I I really do appreciate like their worldwide studio or whatever. They make games that I like, like creative, cool-sounding games that I enjoy, and I appreciate their platform. So I want a PS4 because I can say, you know what, I don't use my PS3 as much now. I use my PC primarily for gaming, but if a game like The Last of Us comes out, I want a PS4 to play that. I want to be able to play Naughty Dog's new game. I want to be able to play Infamous Second Son because I love the first two. You know, a lot of their exclusives are some of my favorite things that I've played on the platform. Yeah, no, I I can see that. It's just right now... I, you know, I probably won't get a PlayStation 4 for like a year end of its life cycle, but that's okay. But, I, you know, I, I think this was a good decision by Microsoft. I'm guessing, Absolutely. I'm guessing they had a lot of data to prove that they needed to do this. I'm guessing that the pre-order numbers were not where they needed to be. Yeah, I don't think this had anything to do with them listening to the fans. I think it was flat out they saw some numbers that said that the dollars weren't going to be coming in. Yeah, and they. That, that, I think the fan response and the actual dollars coming in synced up this time i don't agree with uh, we had a debate with it on the forums and i don't think personally that this was any sort of consumer victory this was hey we looked at our 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 testing numbers and we're not making enough so we got to drop this and we're going to say it's for the fans and i I don't think it had the impact they wanted it that i people still don't seem to be that warm toward it and i think that's the hundred dollar price difference and the mandatory. Well, you're going to, you're going to see a subsidized console that's going to get announced here in the next two months. There's going to be a 200 or $300 subsidized console that, that rumor has been around for almost a year and a half. Now you're going to see it. And that might change some minds. Maybe. I think that could do it. If you say, if you promise to sign up for like three or four years of Xbox live, they'll do it. Yeah, but people don't like cell phone companies because they have to do that. Yeah, but people still do it when an iPhone 5 comes out. Because they have no choice. They don't have another option if they want an iPhone. Only this time, the headphone jack is on the bottom. <laughs> Anybody else see that commercial? Uh, the only one? Okay. Uh, anywho, anywho, Derek, I didn't mean to take away from your news section, so begin, sir. Not at all. Well, we learned some new stuff about Final Fantasy XV recently with the game being announced at E3. Uh, Square Enix sent out a press package that has uh, a piece of key art that shows off five of the main characters as well as their names and a little bit about their backgrounds. So, so far, the the playable cast that they've shown off is exclusively male, which is kind of odd and has some people wondering. And they have said that there are going to be more female characters uh, announced later on, but we don't know if they're going to be playable. Um, Right now... Uh, the confirmed cast is the main character is uh, Noctis Lucius Calum. He's the prince of the Lucius kingdom. Uh, Gladiolus Amicita is his friend and bodyguard, basically. Ignis is his cool, spiky-haired, glasses-wearing, smart guy friend. Prompto is the guy with the freckles that's uh, kind of an outcast. And Corleonis is an older military hero that uh, goes he goes along with Noctis' crew, but he's not exactly thrilled with what they're doing. So cool. and, uh, we have character names and and Donald Duck is uh, Mickey's advisor and he Dolan. Is... <laughs> Hello, Dolan. That's Dolan called Duke. that's called Kingdom Hearts. It's very similar and I'll be buying both. But <laughs> yeah, I, I, I kind of agree with Derek, though. I'm a little I, I don't want to say down, but like you know, I, I love the colorful casts of Final Fantasy games. And these five dudes, I'm literally like. Okay. I, have, I have to admit, I saw it and I, I didn't say that's a Final Fantasy cast. Like, you look at 13, and I don't necessarily like those characters. It looks they, like a Final Fantasy cast. Yeah, yeah. like, they look like your, your, really? weird, your weird, wacky, colorful Final Fantasy cast. And I like this. I well, think I, they look like Final Fantasy characters, but they're they're more subdued. And well, that, the, that's the what variances I, that's, come in there, like, the little details in their costume rather than being ridiculously flashy. Well, I, did. I, I think that's what throws me off, is that from a design standpoint, they look more... 
this is a fantasy based on reality, you know, a reality where you can jump off walls, but it's still, you know, it, I understand the aesthetic they're going and I think they fit in that world. It's just strange because this kind of visual fidelity, you know, 13 looks great and it has that distinct kind of anime E final fantasy look. And whereas this looks a lot more normal, like they have fabulous haircuts, but that's, that's and par for the course. Don't forget about the zippers. People, not that many. There no. are some zippers, but well, not I, as many I didn't want to put words into Derek's mouth. What I, because uh, Derek made the comment that there weren't a lot of, there wasn't a female cast member yet, a female player character or whatever, formal cast member, I guess is what we'll say. And so I wasn't saying I wasn't trying to put words in your mouth, Derek, and say that I didn't like the art style, and that meant that you didn't like the art style. It's just that this didn't strike me as a Final Fantasy cast, and maybe that's a maybe that's a good thing. You know, I, I'm not trying to be down on that, but I look at these five. I don't want to say bros, but these five dudes, for lack of a better word, and I'm not interested in any of them. And, sure. But now, but now maybe that's like a once I you, see them in action, once I see them in, you know what though, interacting I, that'll make it better. I felt that way too, Rob. But when I read that the actual description of their characterizations, it struck me as so different from what Square normally does. Because what do they normally say? They go, oh, "Look at this guy. He's got a son. He's Saz, and look at him." We, we put him in here because he's our token black guy. He's and got look, a chocobo in his hair. Look at yeah. him. And I don't know. something they, they describe the relationship of the characters as opposed to some superficial trait. And I really like that. I was like, oh, this, wait, that's that's true. Like they didn't say like this they is, said, oh, this, this, this girl is this guy. That you picked up. <laughs> yeah. Like he said, oh, this is, you know, he's a but he's not his childhood friend. And that strikes me as like Luke and Guy from Tales of the Abyss. This guy is kind of their older advisor who, you know, he's cool with them. So that strikes me as that this is going to be a group. That has some chemistry, so that that's a good starting point because that's the Persona Four crew. They have chemistry. That's you know, true. That's true. And so you really appreciate those characters in terms of their relationships to one another and themselves. So it's early to say if they're going to get that right, but I I like seeing that this isn't oh look at all this flashy ridiculousness. It's just yeah they have your very in vogue Japanese haircuts and these are their relationships. And I'm like okay, I'm, cool. I'm not even going to be cynical or cautious about it i just i want the crap out of this game yeah i, I mean think it looks fantastic yeah there's no question involved i'm buying the game it looks like something that i want to play I, I think, and i uh, think it's i think it's valid that you guys have concerns by the way i'm not trying to dismiss yeah. anything that you're saying it's just for me i'm i'm stoked i i love the designs i think it all looks fantastic i think Square I'm... has almost gotten me back on board completely and admittedly, that may have been because of Kingdom Hearts, but I, I maintain that it's because they put on a good show. They showed off games that we wanted to see. They did a great job with the 14. And, you know, I, I feel like, you know, this is a good start. I guess what I want to wait for is even though they've said time and time again that Final Fantasy 15 isn't as linear as 13, I want to see what they mean. Like, I, I want to see a non-linear Final Fantasy game. And and I, I hear the arguments all the time. People are like, well, in Final Fantasy VI, you only had one town you could go to for each story beat. Yeah, but you know what? It still let you do a lot of side quests and a lot of stuff that I really liked. So I want to see that. I, and so if I see that in a little bit more reveal stuff for fifteen, then I'll be totally in. I, I expect to see that because Kingdom Hearts has that a lot. And this looks a lot like Kingdom Hearts. And... It's the, the director, uh, I, I don't know if he's the director, but Hajime Tabata, the guy who worked on Type Zero is in there. And Type Zero is very well regarded. And they said, you know, there's a world map. So I'm getting the impression that we're going to get an action RPG kind of in the vein of like a Seiken Densetsu sort of thing. Where like, you know, you have, you know, there's a linear story path. You can't go everywhere all at once. But as the game goes on, it will open up. I think you'll see a more traditional Final Fantasy style progression in this. Then I like it. Are we going to see oh. multiplayer? I don't I know. Threw, don't, I threw a I bomb. Really want it. I, I threw a it. bomb. Are we going to see multiplayer? I, you know, it seems structured in a way that would make that work, actually. But and I'd be down with that. I I would try it if it existed, but I don't think it needs it. Yeah, I don't. I don't think it needs it. But a Tales game also doesn't need it. But it makes a Tales game fantastic. Okay. So no, I'd be on board with it. I, I'm when, you, when you I'm, say multiplayer, I'm. A, I thought you meant like versus. Is that what you meant, or did you mean cooperative? No, I meant oh, no, like, I meant hey, I'm controlling Noctis. Oh, well, hey, I'm controlling oh. 
Yeah, okay. Lady Ola well, Espanza Danda. I don't know why I'm, I immediately thought you meant like death matches. Oh no 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 no! I oh no no no! I mean like the, co-op. Just the menu designs look and the way that it's showing all the characters interacting. I, that just something just clicked in my head where I'm like maybe. You know what though? They did say <laughs> Kingdom. They they said we're looking at multiplayer for Kingdom Hearts and connectivity. So I'm like I would not write anything off at this point, and that's what's exciting to me. Yeah, like, I, and again, we don't know what we're going to get out of this. And again, I'm excited for this game the way I was excited when I saw the first 13 trailer. And I don't mean to say that as, oh, it just ended up disappointing me. No, I was really excited because it looked so freaking different. It did. And if this is what we're... Hey, you know, let, I can't wait for Tokyo Game Show. You know, this game will probably come out in 2016, and, I, you know, we'll see. <laughs> I hope it makes it out next year. I really do. I think it'll come out... I, I'm going to say summer. I'm going to say summer next year. I would fully expect to see this out next year. That's that's also my prediction. I don't know if it'll be summer or like winter, but I, I personally think it's going to be. I, next I think year. I think Square Enix has gotten into at least in recent years they've gotten into the mold of releasing Final Fantasies in non crazy time of the year. So I don't think you're going to see this in like November October. I think you're going to see it in like March April, which I think is a good decision because you don't want this going against Call of Duty. 17. Wait, wait, you think this will be out March or April of next year? Uh, no, I would say maybe like June. Maybe say, June. I, I definitely don't think it'll be that because Lightning Returns comes out in March. Yeah, I could, oh, I could see really? tail end. Oh, wow, no. February, wow. February for Lightning Returns, by the way. Oh, wow. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, I don't see them not releasing two Final Fantasies that close to uh, each other. Maybe it is going to be 2015. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think it'll be 2015. next year, just the, the tail end of next year. Well, yeah, like late summer or winter. Like October, maybe. September. Anyway, more news. Yep. Because yeah, we, we can speculate got on, this hung all up day. on that one. <laughs> yeah, this is uh, this is relevant to my interests. The Legend of Heroes art books are coming uh, to North America, courtesy of Udon Entertainment. They release I a like lot of Udon. really neat art books. Yeah, like for they've done Street Fighter, Doctor Stalkers, uh, Atelier, lots of cool stuff. It's interesting that they would choose to localize these, uh, much like they localized the Valkyria Chronicles three art book because that game never came out here. But these, these are, it's two books. Uh, one is the characters and one is the illustrations. Those are the, t- the subtitles. And they have art from all of the Legend of Heroes or Sora no Kiseki games, including all the ones that aren't out here. So it's going to sting, but I'm going to buy those. Um, yeah. We haven't heard any news from Exceed or anybody about a possible release for the rest of that series. But I haven't given up on them forever. Uh, I still think that there's some hope that they could get over here. But anyway, those art books are coming out, and that's cool. Especially if you're a crazy fan like me. So, also, Zaboid Games has announced their next game. They are the creators of Cthulhu Saves the World, Breath of Death, and most recently, Penny Arcade's On the Rain Slick Precipice of Darkness. So, their new game is going to be called Cosmic Star Heroine. And it is inspired by Fantasy Star 4 and Suikoden, Mm -hmm. which is awesome. Uh, it's got it's got like a sci-fi kind of theme, like sci-fi anime, and it is going to be a game that has humor, but it is not a parody like the old Zavoid games. So I don't know. They're they're developing it on a new engine, so there's promise there. Um, I was getting a little bit tired of the Penny Arcade games, but there it is. I, so all all I can say is that. When you go and you list every game that everybody ever loved as your inspiration, I ask, well, what about them that they're turn-based RPGs? Uh, so I color me. I will leave it at I am skeptical, and yeah, I also I, think that I'll there might be a little capitalizing on nostalgia. Probably the they showed off the art of the main character, and she very much looks like sort of an Alice uh, lookalike from Fantasy Star Four. She's she's got white hair, and I'm not saying that that's bad. It's it's a cool design, and I like it. But we we'll see. There's there's no concrete information yet, so there's no way for us to tell if it's going to be good or not. But they just wanted to announce it, and it is coming out sometime next year, I think. Cool. So, or maybe end of this year. I'm not sure. Uh, speaking of new games, Gust, the Atelier developer, has announced a new game that is not an Atelier game. It's called Chronos Materia, and it's for the Chronos? PlayStation Vita. I know, right? They they really picked two words that get my attention. Right. It it looks I don't know, there's not all they've really released are a couple of environments and two character designs and like an end of battle screen. But it's a it's another JRPG. Um the characters are designed by the Vocaloid artist, so if you're familiar with Hatsune Miku, 
and those characters. It's the same artist that did that. The game does have an item synthesis system, which is a Gust trademark. And we have no idea if it's coming out in North America, but it's coming to Japan on September 26th. I would be surprised if we don't get that. And they seem to make pretty good JRPGs, so I think that could be something to look forward to. Yeah, I'll check it out for sure. I like Atelier, so. And my final piece of news for today, it's a Japanese heavy news day, I guess. But uh, Dragon Guard 3, or Dragon Dragoon 3, as it's known in Japan, and I think Europe calls it that too, doesn't it? I'm not uh, sure. Anyway, Dragon Guard 3 is coming out in Japan in September. I'm sorry, not September, October 31st on Halloween, which is fitting because the game is gory and creepy. But they uh, they released a trailer for it, which is cool. And they also announced that it's getting a special edition that's 202 US dollars. Holy crap! Yen. Yeah. What? And it's got a book about Dragon Guard with a poster. 24-track CD, History of Drakengard Blu-ray, a novel prelude, an art book, a DLC code, and the game itself. And I believe I heard that they're doing some voting to decide what kind of DLC costumes are going to be in the game, and they're going for legacy stuff. So you can vote for costumes from Drakengard 1 or 2 or near to be included in that. The game itself looks really cool. Uh, that trailer that they released today is really stylish, and the CG in it's pretty awesome looking. So hopefully we get this one. We got the last two. I would like it if we got a costume that was a face mask and it was just ugly daddy Nier's face. Uh, I thought you were going to say Vice. Well, that would be Vice, cool too, I guess. You Vice, you dumbass! Oh, I just think that uh, I haven't beaten Nier and I keep meaning to because it seems like the kind of thing that I would love. But man, is daddy Nier ugly. Like sure the, non, the non-Japanese version. His face yeah, is like, is. I'm really excited to see more of Drakengard three because god i really wanted to love dragon guard one i got really excited for it and then i played it well the game wasn't exactly fun to play it wasn't very polished but the the lore and the story is really fascinating it's just it's crazy so i hope to see I, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what they do with with three one and i didn't actually play two but i read some of the synopsis kind of stuff for two uh, the games actually kind of link into near so this would technically be the fourth game in that universe, if you want to count it like Does, that. So, oh, Nier takes place in the Drakengard universe? Loosely. It's uh, kind of speculative. But they, they, it's basically they, they like one of the of endings. That. One of the endings from uh, Drakengard 1 sort of implies that Nier is what happens afterwards. Oh. That's yeah. actually kind of cool. I like that. Yeah. It's cool. And that's the last piece of news I got today. All right. Well, uh, thank you, everybody, for listening to Random Encounter. Be sure to listen to our sister podcast, Rhythm Encounter, with these two fine gentlemen as they talk about music. Go ahead, plug, 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 plug. Rhythm Encounter yes. is a podcast. You can listen to it on your whatever. On any device you want. Very good. It has music. And Rob. No, really, really uh, it's a great show. Rob was on the last episode. So if you can't get enough of this illustrious host, you'll be able to hear him on the other podcast. It's now no actually... one's going to download it, guys. Oh, whatever. It'll actually be the exact same cast that's on here today. So if you want to listen to the three of us talk some more, and specifically about video game music, we did boss themes on the last episode. So check it out. On, we're on iTunes. Rate us, subscribe, all that. And do the same for Random Encounter if you like what we're doing. Yep. We're Which up. you better. Yeah, man. We're up to 46 reviews on Random Encounter. We got four more before we before the end of the year that I want to get to. I want to get to 50. And again, always looking for kind words, looking for positive criticism. You know, there, we can definitely make the show a little bit better. I know. I know. One of these days I'll play Shadow Hearts. I know. All right. Just relax. Yeah. I got my 3DS. Let me play it. The problem is when you play it and don't like it, I may actually kill you. No, no, no. The thing is that when I played like three or four hours of the original game, I really did like it. It's just that I I don't know why. I picked the dumbest point in my life to start playing that game. It was like right after I started dating Jackie and the school year had just started up. <laughs> yeah, that was really smart. So, you know, now that I'm married and, you know, I can let my body go to hell. I don't have to go to the gym anymore. I can just play all the games I want. That's what happens, right? Oh, God. That, oh, God. Oh, God. Okay, I might have to go. Is she lurking <laughs> behind you right now? So she just walked up and hit me. I can you. Yes. Yes, sweet. Ah, the okay. beauty of marriage. Yes, the beauty of marriage, ladies and gentlemen. So thanks again for listening to Random Encounter. Be sure to subscribe to us on iTunes or through the RSS feed. Give us positive reviews, and we'll or see. Or he dies. <laughs> and we'll or see. He, or he dies. That's, that's, or, that makes it sound infinitely more dire. And we'll see you all later. See ya. Put down the knife. <laughs>